Okay, good morning, good morning, good morning. Week number one, phase three, how to love and reach the lost. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Those of you who are watching online that can't be here, we welcome you. Those of you here, I'm so glad to be continuing the journey with you. So glad to be continuing the journey with you. I do have a few um, just uh, housekeeping things um, to, uh, to go over. First of all, when you come in, there's some note paper there. You can always help yourself to that if you don't have enough. There's a binder if there's any left. If not, I have one here. Uh, you're more than welcome to take those if you need more space, because oftentimes we don't give, maybe you don't have enough space to write your notes in there. You can grab that. Uh, so let me just get rid of this. Perfect. Okay, so... One of the things that we know is that Jesus came to seek and save the lost. One of his main purposes and points um, was, well, it's probably the main one, uh, was to come and, uh, and find us, to seek and save, to find us and save us because we were lost. And where were we lost from? From him. What else comes to your mind? Where were you lost from? We were in darkness. Okay. Very good. Yeah. You can't hear me very well. Let me just move that a little bit closer maybe. Is that better? Okay. Uh, so, so we were lost. And we talked about, remember, when we talked about in the beginning, we started in our relationship with the Lord, which was first phase. Uh, our relationship with God, and then this second phase, which we just finished, our relationship with each other, with the family of God. But when we started, we talked about in the original setting in the garden that they had a perfect relationship, humans and God. And that got messed up because of the rebellion uh, of, of Adam and Eve. And so the relationship was, was broken. And what Jesus came to do was Jesus came to restore that relationship with the Father. Now, we understand Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we're never at any time excluding one over the other, uh, even though they, they have different uh, roles, let's say, <laughs> that they play as a part of the Trinity. But we were separated from God, and Jesus came to restore that to bring us back. And so then what happens is, of course, is that Jesus then in us and the Holy Spirit in us then uh, wants to continue that process through you, which we're going to talk about more as we go along. But our main emphasis here is going to be how can we love the lost? How can we love them? Oftentimes in the church, we do just the opposite and we do what? Criticize them. Judge them. Re Reject them. And so are we drawing them closer or pushing them away? Oftentimes in the church, we push the lost away. And so, so we're going we're gonna to talk about building a bridge to the lost. And oftentimes in the church, instead of building a bridge, we build a, we build a wall. Instead of building a bridge, we build a wall. And then it's hard for, and then we're like, well, why, we just don't seem to be able to reach the lost. Well, they're just, you know, going to die and go to hell. But, you know, here we are. We would help them if they would come. But anyway, so, so what we want to do is we want to build a bridge to the lost, an opening. It doesn't mean that we, that we condone or we accept their lifestyle or other things. Of course not. But we do have to have an open door. Oftentimes, not often, but most of the time we see Jesus uh, in the New Testament. We see Jesus in the Bible in his life that who was he condemning? The religious leaders. Oftentimes, Jesus was condemning those who actually were making it hard for people to enter the kingdom of God. They weren't making it easy. They were actually making it hard for them to enter the kingdom of God. And that's why Jesus was so hard on them. Because in the name of God, they were keeping people from God. They weren't, they weren't helping people, really. They were so focused on the law that they missed out on what was the most important thing. So, so we're, gonna, we're just going to kind of journey through that naturally. Now, I am partly, part of my gifting is evangelist, but that's not really what we're talking about here. How do we evangelize? 
but how do we love and reach the lost? And in that, of course, there's evangelism. That's a, that's a natural given, but it's not as if it's some kind of a program that you want you to learn this program and then we want you to go do this program. More importantly, what we want is, is to live a lifestyle of evangelism. How do we live every day where we consider the lost? That we're open to God working through us to reach the lost. And how can we plant and water seeds and be ready for the, the harvest? Because many of us, um, many of us are not, are not, many, many of us are not ready. Even if somebody was sitting in front of us and they said, hey, I want to follow that Jesus you follow. They're like, um, okay, come to church on Sunday. Yeah, yeah. So most of us, even if someone was in front of us and they want, we don't know what to do. So we're going to help you with that. We're going to just very simply, how do I just make this a lifestyle? How do we make this a lifestyle? And so a lot of this for me, I've trained um, in doing this actually full time. Um, but, but for me, it became out of this um, practical need in Poland. We understand in Poland that historically it's been 98% Catholic. And it's not as if being Catholic is something that's bad. I was raised Catholic. Any Catholics among us? I'm recovering. I mean, uh, uh, any uh, ex? Uh, yeah, okay. But I did. I grew up Catholic, but I didn't know God. We had all the all the 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 do's and don'ts and the the the, the religious patterns and all the things that we were supposed to do. But they did not equate to relationship with God. So, anyways, and in Poland, it's it's almost more in the religion because it's so old. Now, you know, they converted to Christianity or Catholicism. I'm going to say like 985. Nine, no one in front of it, 985. So they've had this religion over a thousand years. So a lot of their, a lot of their tradition and religion was rather more uh, medieval, if I could say that. It was just, you know, you can even indulgences and all kind worship of Mary and, you know, just just deep rooted. And so when, when you, when you're in a country and you're trying to reach people that think they already know God, but on the other hand, no, they don't. And then when they look at you, because the Catholic doctrine would say, even though some would maybe say differently, but generally speaking, there's no salvation outside of the church, their church, the Catholic church. You can't be saved outside of the Catholic church. And so for you, so for anyone else who's not Catholic, generally speaking, historically, it has been you or you're a cult. So you might as well be Jehovah Witness or Mormon. And that's how we were looked at. That's how Protestants are looked at in Poland. So anyway, it's long story short. But um, so to try to reach them because you're the cult and you're trying to reach them with the gospel message, which they kind of think they already have, but no, they don't. Uh, I mean, in its totality of eternal life. Uh, it's, it's very challenging. And so what I found was, as we were helping Polish church planters, I, I led two projects. The first one, I had six churches, and the other one, I had nine. And as I'm trying to help those uh, Polish church planters, they they were very religious. And, and it became very challenging. And so part of the goal was, is that if we could just, if I could help them reach one person, the most simplest common denominator, if we could just reach one person. And so I began to break that down, and thus came the need for how do we really reach the lost? How do we do that? And I said this to someone recently, and I don't remember exactly where, but um, uh, what if, what if each one of us reach one person in the next five years? Even five years. I'll give you five years. What if? What if? And it's not like a mandate. It's not like we're going to check up on you, but it's just, would you dream with me? And it's not like we're trying to double the church, but in a sense, that's that would probably happen. Now, not everyone that you reach is necessarily going to come to church with you, and that's okay, because that's not what we're about. We're about the kingdom of God, about reaching the lost and helping them follow Jesus, and wherever they do that, you know, we want to help them do that. And so sometimes we make it so difficult and then we reach very few people. So we're just going to kind of make it very, very simple for us as a lifestyle. How do we do that? How do we do that? We're going to journey together in doing that. Then what if, what if, he, what if each person reached one person in the next year? And then what if they started reaching other people? 
Could you imagine how quickly we could reach the world? Could you imagine how quickly we could reach the world, at least with the gospel? Now, we're not saying that they're going to choose to follow Jesus. That's up to them. But at least they would have a proper understanding of what that means and the choice that they're making for or against Jesus, not Christianity or the church. Just think, would you dream with me? Would you dream with me? And so we're just going to, we're going to, we're going to journey on that together. So a couple of other um, practical things. I think we're all familiar with our process already. There's one process that we did change for you um, and it's your registration card. Uh, so on it, you have the front. We do want you to fill this out. Maybe we don't have all your information. Maybe we do, maybe not. And certainly your date of birth, right? That'll help your table leader there, um, your small group leader know when your birthday is going to come up and be ready to celebrate, at least give you a candy bar, sing happy birthday and pray for you. We want to do that. And then the other thing is, if you noticed on the back side of it, so we want you to turn this in before you leave today. And I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, okay, but but maybe not everyone. So I, I want you to make sure that you turn this in, you fill it out, you turn it in today. And then on the back side, you're going to take your own attendance. Okay. Uh, we'll probably still have a sheet out there just in case you forget, then we'll know. But the way this works, and I've been saying it from the beginning, is that this is a pass or fail course. No, just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. No, there's two things. Either you participate, which is like an audit. You're going to just audit the class like you would a university class. You pay the fee, you go to class, but you don't have to do anything else. You're not going to get a grade. You're not going to get credit. You're just going to audit it. And you can do that. You can do that. So at the, at the bottom there, it says you'll have, you'll have participated. You're a participant, and that's great. That's great. But if you want to complete it, you need 70%. It means you need to come 70% of the time. It means, means you need to do 70% of the time at home with God, 70% of the member verse, et cetera, that you, actually part, that you actually complete it, not just in presence. And I, I want to encourage you. I know for, for a lot of us, um, we, we've just, as usual, we'll just kind of take this as a Bible study and we'll do what we want. And that's okay. We're okay with that. Because I know when you come, even if you come once, you're going to grow. You're going to grow in your relationship with God. Those of you watching online, you're going to grow in your relationship with God. But how much more so if you actually go through the process of what it is that we're really trying to offer you? So let me say a couple of things about that. One is, is that many of you are doing a devotion at home already. Please feel free to put that aside for the next seven weeks. Just put it aside for the next. It's not going to go anywhere. It'll be there when you want to start up again in eight weeks. But for the next seven weeks, I want you to, I'm going to encourage you, focus on this. Focus on this. Somebody asked me the other day, like, well, why is what? What are we paying for when we pay? Well, quite frankly, um, you're paying for accountability because you're not something that's free. You don't value it. That's the first reason. I'm just going to be quite honest with you. The first thing is, is that anything that's free is not valued as much. Now, not necessarily. Don't misunderstand me, but generally speaking, and then it's more like, you know, well, okay, now you're invested in it. First thing. And the second thing is, is binders and papers and printing and pens and memory verse cards and holders and all that costs money. Candy bars, all that just costs money. <laughs> and as most of you probably know, our, our church, we just get by month to month. It's not like we have an excess. Now, we do believe that's coming. And it's not so that we can have more money to spend more money, but so we can do more ministry. Wouldn't it be wonderful we had if we could really encourage someone and pay someone to help us with children or teenagers or senior adults, or visit care visiting, that we could actually begin to, you know, pay people. Not that we, yeah. I mean, there's a balance there because, quite frankly, really, we, we're already doing much of that, but we're limited. But the more that we can do, the more that we could actually reach more children as an outreach. We could reach more teenagers, et cetera. And other ministries, grief share. There's just a lot of ministries that we like to do, but quite frankly, we just just get by as far as volunteers and finances are concerned, just the practicality of it. And so all the money which you've paid for the course just goes into the fund, the JOD fund, and everything we spend then comes back out of that. It doesn't go in anyone's pocket. It's not like someone's making money. Uh, we may even lose money. I don't know. Um, but I just just to, uh, kind of let you uh, know and understand and clear that up for you. A couple other things. I do encourage you to come on time. Um, Usually the snacks are out by 1030. 
So if you want to grab those and come right to your table, the sooner we start, the more time we have. Oh, I'm sorry, I meant 10. Yeah, 10. The evening one starts at 6.30, so that's probably where I got that half past mixed up. But anyway, 10 o'clock, uh, if you can be here by then. And then as quickly as possible, come to your table, because we've prepared a whole table um, uh, discussion and participation for you at your table. And thank you, leaders that are helping us with that. You guys are a great and amazing blessing. But we do purpose to help you so that you can so that you can process this further. So just to remind you the way this works is that we, Michelle and I, today, I'm going to be doing the, the, the kind of the launch and primary teaching today, but we share, as you know. So we're going to teach you something. And it's really not a Bible study. Even today will be a little bit more like that. We're teaching you something. And oftentimes it happens when you, when you, did Jesus, you know, often he would ask questions, but the most time he was just preaching. He preached. And then later he got together with the smaller group, the disciples or the apostles, and they they kind of process that. What did you mean by that? I didn't get that. And so they could spend time together. So we're teaching you, then you're going to go home and you're going to study it. Hopefully you will. You're going to go home and you're going to study and you're going to, you and the Father, you and the Holy Spirit, you're going you're gonna to work through this. You and Jesus, you're going to work through this some more on your own. And then you're going to come back at your table and you're going to have a few questions to discuss. And that's where you get an opportunity to say, hey, I didn't understand that. Or, hey, this really stood out to me. This is Jesus just really is revealing this to me. The Holy Spirit is really helping me. That's the time for you at your table to do that. And so I encourage those three parts. You're going to hear it. You're going to study it. You're going to discuss it. See how that works? So that's the plan. That's the plan. So I encourage you, be all in as much as you can, because you're going to get as much as we have to give you. It's not perfect. It's not everything, but it's what we have. And we want you to glean from all of it. So, so any um, questions about that? I just wanted to make a comment, um, <clears throat> kind of going back to what we were talking about before. So the title of this little session is um, uh, how, to, how to Love, How to Reach the Lost. And I, I want to make a distinction in your minds about vocabulary. We have biblical words and biblical concepts. And then what we need to do is translate those when we're talking about to other people. So for instance, how to reach the lost. Right away, does something strike you about the word lost, right? It, strike, it can be offensive to people. We understand biblical language and the scripture that says Jesus came to save and seek the lost. But sometimes in our encounters with people who every one of us was lost, we all were separated from God. We all needed to be reconciled, right? So you wanted, So I just want to encourage you as we teach these things, there's biblical language and how God sees things. And then there's language of communication and bringing people in and and helping them. So I just want to make the distinction. So God saw us as lost children that he needed to come and rescue. But that doesn't mean you go up to someone and say, you're lost. Because immediately you've offended their, their flesh, their soul, and they don't hear you, right? So we'll help you with the distinguishing of in the course and talking about uh, how God views us. And we all know we all were lost and separated, but we want to make sure we understand uh, biblical concepts and, and how God sees things and how would then we translate to reach literally everybody around us. Mm -hmm. You don't yeah. really even have to seek lost people much. You live with them. Yeah. You shop with them. You, don't, you know what I mean? The lost are us <laughs> and all around. <laughs> Thank you, baby. Thank you for that clarification. We are going to talk about that words we use, how we communicate uh, on, a, on a, a normal vernacular, if you would. Uh, one more thing just about your binder, which you already know, it's yours, uh, and no one is going to look at it unless you let them. So it's as private as you make it. So if you want to be private in there like a journal, you go right ahead. That's for you. We, we want you to do that, but no one's going to look at it. We're not going to ask you to turn that in. That's really for you. So please be as free as you want with your notes in, in your binder. Okay, let's pray. Father, you're so good. And we come to you today hungry for more of you, hungry for more of you, that we will grow in you, in you and us. 
and that we will be transformed, having been in your presence more and more into your likeness. And then each day as we, <coughs> as we walk with you, that you, you work through us, you minister tr- through us, you love through us, because you've chosen <laughs> this to be the process of how you reach your lost children. Yes, with the help of the Holy Spirit, but it's through us. That's your plan. We're it. There's no other plan. We're it. And so we are desperate to have a deeper and greater understanding of how to do that. So would you help us with wisdom? Teach us things we just don't know. With knowledge, help us, Father. How do we how do, we do this? How do we do this? And so, God, we, we're hungry for you, Holy Spirit. We give you permission to work in us, to work in us. We commit this time to you, this journey with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so what we're going to do is, uh, is we're going to look at a couple passages today about this. But one thing I do want to encourage you, that we're all on this journey together, even though I stand here as the teacher today, that I'm also a participant because I continue to grow and to learn how do I reach the lost? How do I, how do, I do that? And so just want to uh, make that very, very uh, clear for you. Okay, so a biblical foundation, that's what we're doing today. We're looking at the biblical foundation today, if you would, for evangelism, for reaching the lost, however you want to, um, you want to uh, say that. So we're going to look at two passages, and we're going to we're going to do. We don't normally do this, but today we're actually going to do a little bit. And don't go ahead in your notes because you'll get just all sidetracked. But just if you'll stay with me, um, but we we often don't do this. But today we're going to do a little bit of a Bible study. Today there's a really simple way, and in the future we're going to do. Somebody asked me the other day, how many phases are there? Well, we got phases for the rest of our life, but we we are going to become an equipping church. God gave those gifts to equip us to do ministry. So we are becoming more and more a church which equips you and your giftings, teaching, the prophetic, the evangelist. We are going to become a church which equips you more and more to do what God has already gifted you to do, giving you gifts to do, but maybe you don't know how to use them. Um, so we're, we're going to help you with that. And so it, later this will become kind of a course, if you would, for teachers How do I study the Bible? How do I study? So I'm going to give you a little example of that today. We're going to do this together, and we're going to use three different things in this basic, simple process of studying the Bible. Observation, interpretation, application. Observation, interpretation, application. And you're going to to have it there in your notes. Uh, We'll help you as we go along, but we're going to look at those three things as we as we go through this to help you um, in your your understanding of this um, uh, biblical foundation. So here we are. We're in Mark chapter three, verse thirteen through fifteen. One of my most favorite passages in the Bible. Does somebody want to read that for us? Just go ahead and read it out loud. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to take this passage of Scripture. Thank you, by the way. We're going to take this passage of Scripture, and we're going to look at three different things. We're going to observe it, we're going to interpret it, and we're going to apply it. So the first thing we want to do is we want to do observation. So one of the things that we do in observation, we want to look at the original setting that sits in Laban. What was really going on there? What do you see happening in the passage? What's the setting? And then you can ask those five why questions, or those five W questions, who, what, when, where, why? Now, they won't all necessarily be applicable uh, and matter much, but it does help you to process it. Maybe one of those is more important than the others, and maybe some of them are irrelevant. Uh, however, any given passage, you can ask those questions. Okay, so let's, um, let's observe the passage. What's going on in the passage? What do you see? Okay, they're on a mountain, so that's a where. Where are they? Where are they? They're on a mountain. What else do you see? Okay, so what was going on was that he called them out. Very good. 
Okay, so he called them out to be with them. So why? Why did he call them out? So they would be with him. Very good. What else? Okay, very good. So there's a lot of people and he called some of them out. By the way, thank you. Thank you, by the way. I'm already, I just want to commend you for taking turns because you know some of us were more extroverts and we like to share a lot and some of us are more introverts and it will take a lot for us to bring it out. So just in your sharing, because I love to do this and I'm, I actually really enjoy this interaction, but we have to take turns and you're doing that beautifully. I'm just commending you and we'll, we'll continue on that. We'll continue on that note. Okay, so there were more than just those um, those few that he was he was calling out. Okay, what else? He was giving them instructions. Very good. Okay. What else? Okay. And then he called them apostles. So he, and when he did that, what was he doing? Just practically speaking. He didn't just say, hey, you're an apostle. But what was he doing? And by the way, any follow-up question like that doesn't mean you have to answer it. It just is just open again to everyone. Gave him assignment. Okay. Sure. Very good. Okay. Absolutely. Very good. And oftentimes it can be that that you're, let's say you're studying through a chapter or a book of the Bible. And so you'll have done some of the, the uh, bigger work that goes into the text of its entirety. And you'll know the backstory, if you would, when you come to a passage. But oftentimes we find ourselves just at a passage. And then, so this is our process of how we do that. But whenever it says that in the text afterwards... Or furthermore, or therefore, exactly. That's very good. You 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 might want to know because it, it will help to contextualize it or give you more information. Okay, what else? And again, we're not doing a deep dive here. We're just kind of generalizing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. What else sticks out to you? Maybe the apostles weren't the disciples, right? And, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So he so he called a lot of disciples, followers, but then he appointed some of them as his apostles that maybe they were going to got to preach. Great. OK, why don't we just um, for the sake of time, because you could just spend hours on this literally. But let's just answer the question. So who is this about? Jesus. OK. And who else? The people. And they were designated as what? OK, so there was just a general crowd, if you would. Um, yes, so there was the general crowd and then there was the apostle. So this is the who. Okay, and what's going on just generally? Just recap. What's that? Right, let's start from the beginning. So what's going on in the text? Just start from the very beginning. So what happened? They went up on a mountain and what happened next? Okay, he called out the ones that want that he wanted what? To go with him. To go with him. There was going to be a personal journey together. He called out the ones he wanted to go with him. It was very specific. And then what happened? They responded and they came to him. It's very important. It's very important because oftentimes there are a lot of invitations, but people don't often respond. But when they do respond, then what? All right. And what what then what next? Uh, hang on a second. Verse 14. Verse 14, what happened? Okay, so out of the out of the crowd, he called the 12 um, and gave them a title or a, um, not really title, but gave them a ministry position. And then what happened? He gave them authority. Um, 
He gave them authority. And before that, what did he do? Okay, so they have to accompany him. They have to be together. So let's look at there when they said they were to accompany him, and then what? What were the instructions that, that he would do? Okay, he was going to wait. First of all, he's going to send them out. Now, if, if any of you watch the, the Chosen and you see this moment when they're all in the room, and then they realize all of a sudden, wait, we're not ready. You want me to go without you? It's a beautiful scene. It's so just real. We just so fantasize the whole thing like, oh, they were ready to go and look at what Jesus was going to do through them. But no, they were going out on their own. Jesus was not going to go with them. And we're going to talk about that more in the course. Jesus wasn't going. He was going to send them out. This is like huge fishermen, tax collectors. <laughs> this is huge. These aren't like these weren't like the scribes and the Pharisees were used to going out and talking to people about the law. This is something completely different, even though I think there were a couple of them there. But OK, going on. So he was going to send them out. And what were they going to do? Preach. And what else? Cast out demons. And how are they going to do that? He gave them authority, and they were going to pray, but he gave them authority. Very good. Okay, so that's our observation. So who, the what, the when. It's, you know, sometime during Jesus' early ministry, sometime because we have this in Mark 3, um, the where, where were they? On the mountain. And we've already talked about the why. why what was Jesus' plan for all that? So these are really good questions to try to give us the original setting. So now that we have the original setting, after you do that, then you want to look at interpretation. What is it about this passage that I want to know more about or that I don't know about and I need to learn? So we begin to ask ourselves to dig into this. And what is it about this passage, just looking at this passage all by itself, what is it about this that you might want to know more about? What sticks out to you? A word, a, um, a, a setting, the information, the instruction. What is it about here that you don't completely understand or want to know more about? What's that? How to share. Okay, what were they? Uh, he was going to send them out, and how, how were they supposed to do that? He gave them instructions, but what's the practicality of it? And we're actually going to look at that biblically. Okay, what else? So you're saying that you would want to dig into more, like what did he mean by authority? Okay, because what we're trying to do here right now is what more do you want to know? What would you want to further study that you don't completely understand? What does it mean to follow him? Very good. What, it, what does it mean to preach? Yeah, what does that mean? So that's a really good question. What did he mean by that? That's where we're at in interpretation. What does he mean by that? Or in the old days, uh, we had this book called Manners and Customs. And I can remember in the old days, you needed a big desk in the old days so that you could spread out all of your resources, all of your various versions of the Bible, your interlinear, your Greek, your, your concordance, your, you know, all, you know, now you can do that on Biblehub.com. <laughs> now, literally, write that down, Biblehub.com. And so you can type in any verse, Mark 3.13. You type it in, and it's going to give you 50 different versions of that verse. They're all right there for you. Any version you want, it's right there for you. And you can parallel them. I want to parallel this and this, and I want to compare them. It'll do that for you. I think only two, but it will do that for you. And then if you want to go to the Strong's, I think it's just STR on the top, or it may say Strong's. You click on that. No, that's not true. So, uh, after, yeah. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah, so you go right to Strong's, you click on Strong's, and then it's going to tell you where in the Bible or where uh, in the Greek the understanding of this, the definitions, et cetera, which we're going to do um, in just a moment. So write that down, biblehub.com. It's a very good resource. I use it most days or anytime I'm studying, I use it. Okay, so a couple of things that we're going to look at is that, so, so that's the process. So you begin to ask yourself, what do I not quite understand? What do I want to know more about? Etc. And then you can begin to dig in. 
Now, we're not going to do a lot of various things, but we're just going to do one. We're going to go to Strong's, and I often use this on Sunday mornings. For those of you who are more intellectual in the gift of teaching, you like that, and you want more. You don't want me just to tell you what it says. You want some proof. And so I try to give you proof and help to um, ex ex expand your, um, your knowledge. Okay. So we're going to look at the word preach. And when we look at interpretation, what does it mean? What questions do you have about the passage? You want to answer those questions, the why questions. Why did he call them? Why did they go to a mountain, et cetera? Okay, so interpretation. So we're going to look at the word preach. And I just copied this right from BibleHub.com, from the Strong's. You'll see that there, preach. Caruso. Caruso is that word there, the transliteration, because this original word, you see it there with characters that we know nothing about, where it says original word. <laughs> That's the Greek word. And some of you, maybe you read Greek, but most of us do not. And so they give us a transliteration, Caruso. And somebody read for us the short definition. What does it say? Proclaim. To proclaim. What else? Herald, preach. So what page are we on? Second page. Second page. You see it there. Preach. All right. So it means to proclaim, means to be a herald, means to preach. And then the definition Right below it. Pretty much the same thing. They're not always the same because the short definition is usually shorter, but in this case, they're the same because it's really a quite simple definition. But when we look at it more, it actually gets into to something a bit more. So the question is, well, what did he mean by preach? Does he mean that like I get to go into the synagogue or I get to go in the temple or I get to stand behind the pulpit? See, these are questions. You, what does he mean by that? What does he mean by that? And so let's figure that out, because certainly everyone can't go up on Sunday morning and stand behind the pulpit, but he's still, he's sending them out to preach. Okay, so uh, properly to herald or proclaim, to proclaim something, to preach or announce a message publicly and with conviction, persuasion. So this isn't in the sense of, um, I, I hate to use the word, um, boring teaching, but this isn't just some dialogue. This isn't just some information which is being communicated. This is something which is being done with passion, with conviction, not like you're teaching something that some someone else wrote or etc. Okay. So uh, to preach, to announce a message publicly and with conviction. So then you continue on to herald. Now we don't use that word uh, anymore. It's kind of an old fashioned word, but refers to preaching the gospel as the authoritative binding word of God. Now, this is our Christian interpretation of the word and how we use it in practice. Okay. It refers to preaching the gospel as the authoritative binding word of God, bringing eternal accountability to all who hear it. Now, that's a very religious way to say that. And I probably wouldn't say it that way, but I, of course, I didn't write this. But that's one person's understanding of this word in the Christian term. And we've used that historically, um, meaning that now that you know you're accountable to it, which is the truth. It just could be said in a nicer way. But uh, um, Herald is also a word that comes from his history. So these words are interesting because we use preaching as often in our new understanding is like we're on this um, type of platform. But these words are actually words of announcing and proclaiming. And heralds in the medieval time often went through the, through the streets and they were heralding something before. Mm -hmm. So this is the concept that's in us preaching or proclaiming. It actually has to do with publicly uh, of, of compelling. The New Testament talks about us compelling and persuading people. Mm -hmm. And this is really not done in what we do persuading high churches. Don't get me wrong. Those are the found. But just to say, so much of Jesus's words here had to do with public um, discourse, public proclamation that brought people come. They, they hadn't heard this before. Mm -hmm. That's so good. That's good. And, and we're going to talk about that. How, and how does this look in practical terms uh, in, in future lessons? But yeah, so it's to announce this. They were to announce it and they were to do it with great conviction to announce something, to publicly proclaim it and to go and to do it. Okay, um, Okay. so preaching is by a herald, preaching by a herald sent from God, it says there as you continue on, a declaration to declare something, to gospelize, 
Do you see that? That's where we get that from, to gospelize. It's actually, this is more, this is more authentic than evangelize. But to spread the gospel, if you would, to spread the good news, to evangelize. Because evangelize, like, what does that mean? But to gospelize, you understand the gospel, the good news. You're supposed to go and spread the good news, gospelize. And it helps to put it better in its context of what it really means you're supposed to do. Because evangelism is like, when I, because I'm an evangelist. So we would, and, and I've told you this before, we would go every week out to the street and we would go to the, the we would go to big events in San Francisco and various um, uh, gatherings of large amounts of people, the Rose Parade, et cetera. But anyway, people would have their sign, turn or burn. Turn or burn. And is it true? What's well, true? It's, I, you know, if that's your message, you know, you know, if God leads you that way, well, okay. But, um, but that certainly wasn't my message. But some people have a, various ways that they herald, that they proclaim, that they want to, they want to spread out, if you would, the, uh, the message. Uh, and it's, it's kind of an interesting uh, tact. But I guess it could be a shocker to some people. But quite frankly, we used to be, a Christian nation. We used to be where the majority of people were Christians. And even now they say, oh, well, we still have them. I don't remember what statistic is. Let's just say 60% or 70% of people claim to be Christian. And then you find out that like 20% of people actually go to church. And then you realize like, oh, okay. And then what does it mean? What does that term mean, Christian? Does that mean you were baptized as a baby? And now you still proclaim to be a Christian. So that it really gets it really gets watered down now. But my point is, is that in the old days when we came with a message, it was shocking to the people something they already knew. Does that make sense? They already knew that. And you were just waking them up. You're just reminding them. And, and again, I'm not saying that the method was right, but we used to be more Christianized. We used to have in society a better understanding when you said something people knew, like what Michelle was saying, we have to be careful about the words that we use and how we introduce Jesus. Okay, so so what so what 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 does this word mean to you? What do you get from that? What are you supposed to do? Oh, uh, no, that's not true. Uh, that's not because now that's now already we're in application, so we can't skip the process. So what uh, what sticks out to you about this this definition, if you would? What sticks out to you? We're on preach, preach. Yep. What's that? Okay. So what sticks out to you is that in preaching is that you're sent by God to do it. Is that what you're saying? Okay, what else? What sticks out to you about this? Oh, right. And, and that's a really good point. You get have someone up preaching anything about um, Apollos or Dionysus. Am I saying that right? You know, some of the other Greek gods. And this is, is from a Greek context. So we're actually using secular words. You know, the Bible does that. We're using secular Greek words, and then we're we're gospelizing them. <laughs> we're using them in a Christian sense, and then sometimes you get you you get both meanings. Now, of course, they use it in the Bible, so obviously it it it, it was contextualized as Christian, but there could be different meanings of the Greek meaning and then the Christian meaning and how we use that word as Christians and maybe how secular um, people use that word. So other people could have been preaching or heralding or declaring, publicizing. A different message. Good. What else? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's good. No, that's really, really good. That there, there is accountable. We are accountable to the word of God. 
we're accountable to it. It's not just something where God speaks to you about something or someone brings you a message and you know it to be true and you discard it. There, there are, there are ramifications to that. There are. So, so if we think about, um, when, when we go and, and proclaim the word, we're not, you know, we're, we're giving the truth, but it's the truth that does its work. It's not us. It's the truth which does its work to help bring conviction to people so that they'll respond to it. So when you're sharing the truth, it's not up to you what they do with it. They become then, if you would, in this context, accountable to it. However, a non-believer is only so accountable um, to, to the word of God. But primarily it's about salvation because without salvation, they, they can't really understand any of it. Okay. No, that's good. That's good. So, um, so anything else stick out to you before before we move on from this passage or from this this uh, uh, definition? Wow! See, that's really good. See the revelation there. This is really good for us. You have to open your mouth, and words have to come out. Otherwise, you're not preaching. So here's the thing. Let's just, just simplify this. What was he saying when he said he was going to send them out to preach? Don't, I don't want a long definition. I just want you to help me just simply understand what did he mean when he was sending them out to preach? Spread the good news. Very good. What else? Giving, everybody a Give, giving everyone a chance to be saved. What else sticks out to you? What's that? Okay, to teach them the good news that they can have eternal life. Anything else about this word? Preach. We're getting into deeper definition. What does he mean by this? What am Okay. Good. Good. So he's not just sending them to preach, but but there he's backing it up with himself. He's backing himself. Okay. So so just simply preaching, understand what we really want to know is what is he saying? Is he saying that everyone should stand up on Sunday morning and get behind the pulpit? No, that would be silly. But he's saying that that he's saying proclaim, make known, announce, publish. So it's not just even words, because it could be written form. Yeah. And they have to understand what they're doing, but but that's that's uh, secondary. 
What, what we're talking about right now is in its context, we're talking about what did Jesus mean by he said, go to do this. That's the deeper study. You stay in the word, dig into it, wrestle with it. Do I really have to open my mouth? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. So that brings us back to the observation of when. Because there's a deeper question. Okay. And he would send them out. So you can ask the question, what did he mean by he would in the future? When did he mean by that? Well, all I'm saying, I'm just answering Kathy's thing there, that they had to have some information to preach. And they, they had to be able, they had to know him. So, so, so again, back in the context of the passage, then we begin to ask ourselves the question, what did he mean by, and he would send them out? He did, it doesn't say there, he's sending them out. It says he's appointing them 12 and he would, future tense, he would send them out. Yeah. You see that? That's good. And if you notice, of course, if you're reading the, the, the book, we're in Mark chapter three. Even though Mark's a short gospel and he speeds things up, but we're in the beginning of the story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah, so they were going to journey with him. They were going to accompany him. They were going to do it together first, and then he would. Okay, so let's move on because we're going to, uh, we, we've got some more that we want to accomplish here. Okay, so another word that I picked out is authority. Authority, exosia. What does he mean by that? Giving them authority. Giving them authority. What's the short definition? Power, authority, weight. And then the longer full definition? Somebody read that for me. Hmm. So this, this authority, there was a weight to it. You like that word? I like that word. There was a weight to it. It was a weighty. It was weighty. It was a moral authority. It had influence. There was influence in that authority. And, and what stood behind the influence or the authority? What? God. And what of God's was there? What does it say at the end of the definition? Spiritual what? Power. So it wasn't just in a spoken word, but there was power behind that authority. He wasn't just saying, hey, go and do this. But he was saying, hey, go and do this with authority. In my name. Oh, now I'm starting to translate a little bit there. Um, in my name and with my authority, with my power. Okay, so there was an, a, a spiritual power, but also could be uh, an earthly power. All right, so if we continue on there, um, lek and imi. So lek is out from, which intensifies limi to be. So it's out from you and to be something. So this authority, it's coming out from you, and it's going to be something. So there, it's not just empty words. Do you see that? There's something's going to happen with this. Something's going to happen. So we see there, we're, we're, we're reading under where it says 1849. That's the Strong's Concordance number. It's a numbered system. Numbered system. And the 1537 is, the, is uh, one of the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? One of the words that it's, it's root words that it's made up from the 1537 and the 1510 to be being as a right or privilege. I give you the right. I give you the privilege. I give you permission. You see that conferred power, delegated empowerment, authorization, operating in the design jurisdiction. Now, did they have authority for everything? Could they tell the, the tax man they didn't want to pay their taxes? 
it's in its context, contextual. And oftentimes we take the Bible out of context. We make it, try to make it do what we want it to do. And we're not supposed to do that. Okay, so in the New Testament, it's a delegated power. It refers to the authority God gives to his saints or followers, authorizing them to act to the extent they are guided by faith. So it's not just because you want to. Not just because you that you want to. Okay, so what now, what sticks out to you as we're interpreting this passage? What sticks out to you from this when he said that he also gave them authority? What sticks out to you? Now just stay right in the context. Authority. Spiritual power. Be bold. That's really good because, because you can have authority and not use it. They had to use it. What? Bold and daring. Yes. Okay. So this is a journey. They're going on a journey with Jesus. And he is the one authorizing them and giving them power. And, 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 and where are they going to use that power? In which context? On their own or? As they were guided by Jesus in this context, Jesus was going to send them, go and do this. And there they had his authority. They weren't acting on their own. This is really important. Okay. Anything else? Faith. Yeah. Faith. Oh, faith. So if I said, no, go ahead. Mm -hmm. So they had to have faith in Jesus that he would guide them. And when they used the authority that they have, did they have to have faith in it and believe in what they were saying or doing? They did. Otherwise, they're just words. Mm -hmm. They're your own, out of your soul, just words. I love that too. And Jesus connects it later in the gospel as well. He says, now his followers. He says, if you have faith, mm. meaning to the measure of your faith as a minister of the gospel, you will step out and do it. So authority and power, I mean, our earthly justice system, uh, judges, we were all that, is mocked after heaven. Mm -hmm. telling you it's my power and I give you the authority to use that power. Mm -hmm. Our faith ties in for us to say, okay, this person needs deliverance and I see it and know it and I believe it. And to the measure that I operate in, I will pray. Mm -hmm. That's so good. All gets connected. That's really good. That's really good. Thank you. So um, see, just for the sake of time, we're going to, because I know we can teach a lot on any one of these points. But what we, and, and hopefully as we journey through this, we're going to we're going to continue right now. We're just at a, um, a, a biblical uh, foundation. So let's move to the next point because we're going to run out of time because we have one more to do after this. So now what about this is applicable? So we've looked at the setting. You look at the setting. Now you're looking at the the interpretation. What does this mean? in its original setting, because we don't want to just make it say what we want it to say. And often we do that as Christians and we take it out of context. We have to look at the setting. What's going on here? Now we ask ourselves the question, what about this is transferable? What about this truth? This setting is transferable to me. What about it is applicable to me? So the first question we ask does any of this transfer to me? Does anything that's happening here, does this, is this transferable to me? Is it applicable to my life? So let me ask you the question. Is anything from this setting applicable to you? Yes. 
Now, not always Jonah got swallowed by a whale. Now, why he got swallowed by a whale may be applicable to you. Yes? So we got to ask ourselves the question, is there anything about this that's transferable to my setting and that would be applicable to me? It's a very good question. So now, how do I apply this? What is it about this that's applicable and how do I apply it to my life? So let's just go through it from the beginning. Not a lot, but let's go through it from the beginning and you tell me what from this is applicable to you, transferable to you. So afterwards, Jesus went up on a mountain and he called out the ones he wanted to go with him. What about that? And simply, what about that is transferable to you, applicable to you? Let's make it personal. Make it personal. Can you just say the same thing in personal? Make it personal. Make it about you. Okay, but in, okay, that's good. In this context, though, what is he calling them to do? Okay, now, yeah, that's really good. So what's happening here is, is Jesus is calling out. To go with him. Is that applicable to you? sentence to go with him very good so is that applicable to you Jesus isn't had just called you oh I'm going to go to church on Sunday amen Jesus hadn't just called you to go to church on Sunday what has he called you to do be with him go with him do you feel that I, I have goosebumps I feel that no I'm serious I'm serious do you feel that? That's the power of the Word of God. That's the power of the Holy Spirit in you that says, hey, this is for you. And the beautiful part is, in this, is that Jesus is saying, come away with me. I'm calling you out, or I have called you out to be with me. Do you see that? That's beautiful. And we miss out a lot in religion. We miss out a lot in Christianity because we make it about do's and don'ts and things to do, processes to go through. That's not what it's about. This is what it's about right here. If you do nothing else, if you never came to church on Sunday, even though we really need that. Um, sorry, I should preface that. It's one of the, can I just say it's one of, the, one of the things that I just like, where's half the people any given Sunday? But let me tell you why I asked that question. It's not because... Like, I doubt your Christianity, or I don't know what you're doing, and it's really none of my business. But, but you know what my heart is? There's something about synergism. Do you know that word? There's something about synergism, that when you get the snowball rolling, it's just a little snowball. But as it keeps rolling, if any of you, I lived in Michigan and Detroit, and we, you know, we had, outside Detroit, but we had snow every winter. You take that little list, a little snowball, and before you know it, man, you've got a huge snowman. It, that's synergism. It just starts rolling. And so there's something about Sunday morning when we're trying to reach new people and they come in the building. It's like, I ain't nothing happening here. I don't know where all the people are, but they're not in this church. I got to go find them somewhere else. And sometimes I feel that way. Can I say that? Sometimes I feel that way because I'm like, you know, if we all came together on Sunday mornings, we could get this synergism and we could... Yeah, so I just want to encourage you. Can I just encourage you? If you can, come. If you can, it's okay. I don't. It, we do take attendance, but it just helps us. Like, it just. And it's not like we look back through and like, oh, Mary missed five. You know, we don't do that. Don't misunderstand me. <laughs> However, we do want to know. And eventually, we're starting our care our care ministry. That's going to say, hey, Mary's been missing for five weeks. Where is she? Is she okay? It's not like she's not paying her dues, but it's like she may be in the hospital, and we don't know. So that's what part of our care ministry is going to be about, is how do we do that. So how did I get off on that one? Oh, Sunday mornings. So I just encourage you, if you don't, don't sleep in. Don't, don't. It's just I'm on my high horse right now, and I can do that because I'm the pastor. Um, but it's just, I just, it's hard for me sometimes when I see there's new people and they look around, it's like, oh, there's not much happening here. I'm half the, most of the seats are empty. Anyway, um, help me, please. All right, I got to move on. What's that? Yes. Yeah. 
Yep. I feel like so many people come into a church and they feel the presence of God. Yeah. You know, yeah. I think those people who don't, maybe they're just not sensitive like that. Sure. You know? Sure, so sure. I don't, I, I don't think you really want people to be there for. I don't mean. No, no, I know what you mean. <laughs> no, I hear you. I, we don't want people to come just because there's people. I, I get that. And I, and we, I, we, we say that to people on Sunday mornings, most Sundays. We want you to sense the presence of God and our love for you. And I tell them that when I write them afterwards. I hope that you felt God's love or that you, that you felt God's presence and our love for you. That's really our goal. Um, and actually lady Carol, I might get her mixed up with her friend. She told me two Sundays ago that she felt at home mm-hmm. that beautiful. And this last Sunday, she got me, of course, we had an event afterwards. We said, I want to tell you what happened to me on Easter. So stay tuned. All right, moving on. Uh, yes, Mary. That's okay. It'll come back to you. Okay, let's move on. Cause we, we've got some more we want to try to accomplish here. Okay. So, and they came to him. What does that say? Does that apply to you? Jesus called them. He wanted them to be with him, and they came. Is it? Is, they responded. Now, now, now vernacular is important to us. Vernacular is really important to us. They responded. And what do they do? They came to him. Is that applicable to you? It says he's, he's already given you the invitation. There's that accountability to be with him. He's already given you the accountability to be with him. And now it's your responsibility to to respond and to be with him. First for salvation and then every day in relationship. This is applicable to you. Because that's what Jesus was saying. He wasn't just saying, hey, I want you to raise your hand. I want you to pray a prayer. He said, no, I want you to journey with me. I want you to come do life with me. And Jesus is saying that to us for every day. Let's do life together. Okay, and moving on. Then he appointed 12 of them and called them apostles. So has Jesus appointed you as an apostle? Yes. Maybe. Maybe. So it's depending on the way you want to interpret this, and we're not going to spend any time on it, depending on the way you want to understand it, what is an apostle and a a sent one, if you would, et cetera. So there's some part of that that's applicable to you, but do you get a title? Not necessarily, no. Now, do you have the gifting, the apostolic gifting? Now, maybe. Because remember, there were many, but there were only a few that he actually appointed as apostles. You don't mind being what? You'll just be a saint, yeah. Okay, so moving on. And they were to accompany him. Is that applicable to you? What are you supposed to do? Follow him. And, I, and sometimes even that word follow, where I love to use that word, sometimes it's like from behind. But it's more like a journey alongside. As we talked about on Sunday about the Holy Spirit, the paraclete that comes alongside of you. Comes alongside to do it together. But the, but the application is still the same. The answer is yes. And he would send them out to preach. Has Jesus sent you out to declare, to publish, to make known, to be a herald? Is it applicable to you? It is. And he gave them authority to cast out demons. Has Jesus, with the, with the directive to go and to share, to gospelize, does he give you authority with that? Does he give you power? Yeah. He does. It's very applicable to you. And to cast out demons. Is that applicable for you? Now, some people believe that somehow God doesn't give us power anymore, that he has restrained us. Yeah, as if there's not demons anymore. That's really good. As if there's not demons anymore. And there are. So if if the devil is still if the devil is still at work taking authority over people's lives, is God still giving us authority to counteract that? He is. He is. Okay, moving on. We've got one more to do. Let me get my pages right. Okay, second passage. We've got about 15 minutes because we started late. You remember that. If we start late, we're going to... Well, we said this last time. We didn't say it this time because we're supposed to start at 10, but if we don't start till 10 after, then you, you go longer in your small group, et cetera. The whole thing gets, gets later. Well, let's talk about it now. It's really good. It's a really good question right now to, to talk about because it happens every week. And it would actually, it would be like 20 past if, if we just let you fellowship. And I mean, it's a really good thing. 
But that's not why we're coming here to spend all that time. Just no, we have a set 30 minute program, if you would, for you to share your joys together, to celebrate what God is doing in your life, what you see him doing. We have time to pray together. That's important. And then we have time to discuss the things that you're learning. So we have a full 30 minute program planned. And if you don't do that, well, we're missing out on part of our purpose. So let's let's recap here. Do we want to start at 10 or is it more like 10 past? And that means we go until 10 past 12. It's open discussion. Yes, Mary. It's true, but but sorry, you're secondary. <laughs> I hate to say that to you, but you're secondary. And they can, you know, they 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 can just turn it on and, and watch it. And we'll instruct you though. Actually, we're gonna decide right now, so stay tuned. What time are we actually going to start? Well, hang on a second though. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. But but you can't drive in the parking lot at 10 and then get your snack and then find your way to the table. That's not starting at 10. It means that you're in your seat that you, and again, I'm, 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 and I'm just trying to facilitate this. What do we want to do? And I'm not saying you have to do either one. I'm just, we have to agree what we're doing because now here we are at the end and you're like, Oh, 12 o'clock. We're supposed to be done. I'm like, well, and again, I, I do apologize. We should have talked about it at the beginning. We should have talked about it at the beginning, but we did talk about it last time. And we actually decided to start a quarter past, but now we're, we're rephrasing that. So can you, and I'm okay with it either way. And it also means the person bringing the snack has to be there before. So it has to be ready by like 10, like 20 past, uh, 20 till. No. We started 10. So you have to be ready by 20, by quarter till at the latest. You have to be ready by quarter till so people can get their stuff. So if you're bringing a your snack, you have to come even earlier. And I'm okay either way. I'm not, I'm just trying to facilitate this. And what do you want to do? Because there's a lot of ramifications in the choice we make. So what do we say? How many of you would like to start um, at 10.15? Okay, those of you watching online, we're going to start at 10, ready or not, okay? Uh, so please just come early. Please plan to be here by 10 till. That will give you time to check your box, to get your notes, to grab your thing, and then just take your stuff right to the table. You can just, while you have your 30 minutes, you have time to do that. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. That's really good. Thank you. Uh, those of you watching online, I misspoke, and thank you uh, for clarifying that. 10.30, because we have small group. So we'll be back here to start at 1030 online. Thank you. That's really good clarification. Okay, moving on here. We have 15 minutes. So, uh, well, we started late. Yes? Yeah. Okay, because you're laughing at me because I'm taking 10 minutes. That you. <laughs> now, this doesn't start until next week because you took 10 minutes in the beginning. So I'm taking it back now. And it will be beneficial to you. So just hang on with me. Okay, so Matthew 28. 16 through 20. For the sake of time, I'm just going to read it. Then the 11 disciples left for Galilee. We're Matthew 28. Then the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Verse 17. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some of them doubted. Verse 18. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Verse 19. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. <clears throat> and at the end of Mark's gospel, he, he says it like this. And then he told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. It's just a little bit more of a, a different way to kind of say the same thing um, and add a little bit. Okay, observation. Observation, who, what, when, where, why. And the best way to do this, especially as a group, if you'll just start from the first verse and work your way through it, don't just necessarily pick out one thing. It will help us to kind of move a little bit quicker here. So um, who is this about? Let's just add, actually, let's add, let's just answer the five questions. Let's do it that way because it'll be faster. Who is this about? The 11 disciples and Jesus. So this is the who. This is the who. Uh, yes, okay, and what? What's going on? That's where you kind of start from the beginning. All right. 
They left for Galilee, and where did they go? To the mountain. Why? Jesus told them to. Now, we're intermixing the questions, of course, because they're applicable. They went there because Jesus told them to. Okay, and then continue. So the, so when they saw him, so he had to show up. Yes? So, so Jesus had told them to go to the, the mountain. They went there, and then he showed up. Yeah? And then what did they do when he showed up? They worshipped him. And then some of them doubted. Some of them doubted. And then, verse 18. Okay, so Jesus started teaching them or talking to them. And what did he tell them? Okay, so he had authority. And what did he, and, okay, and what kind of authority? In heaven and on earth, not just earthly, not just heavenly, both. And then? Okay, start from verse 19 in the beginning. What are they supposed to do? Go and make. Now, I, I, I differentiated this for you before, but I'm just going to do it. No, I'm not. I'm sorry. Uh, we're just observing. Okay, so they're supposed to do what? Go. It's two different things. We've made it one. It's two different things. Go. And as you go, do what? Make disciples. Where? all nations, and then? So after you've gone and you've made disciples, you're supposed to baptize them. And, and how do you do that? All right, there's the Trinity for us. In verse 20. Okay, so teach who? Okay, remember Jesus is still giving them instructions. He's telling them, now, now that you've um, made disciples, they're supposed to do what? Teach them and teach them to obey. And what are they supposed to obey? Command. Which commands? No, no, look at the text. Which commands? All what? All the commands he's given them. It's not the, you remember they had, uh, is it 650 or something like that? Laws. <laughs> 650, not just the 10. So Jesus said, teach them the commands I have given you. It was important. And then? So as he's giving this instruction, he's assuring them. And what is he assuring them of? I'm going to be with you. I have authority in heaven and on earth. And remember, this is after the resurrection. I have been given all authority. I have been given all authority. And what are they supposed to do with it? Go. And then he assures them that he's going to do what? I'm going to be with you. And for how long will he be with you? To the end of the age. Okay, so this is our basic observation. Basic observation. Um, so... We know who this is about. We know what's going on. We, we don't really know when, but it's, uh, what chapter are we in? 28. So this is really important to us to know this is the end of the, this at the end of the Jesus' story as far as being with them. Yes? Um, and what what's happening in this passage? I'm sorry, what? Just briefly, what's happening in the passage? Jesus is giving them instructions. He's giving them authority. Very good. And why? Why did he do this? So they would spread the word. Yeah? Which word? The good news. The good news. Because it said there in Mark's gospel, right? Preach, declare, publish, caruso. Proclaim the good news. Gospelize. Yeah? Gospelize. Go and gospelize. All right, so the first question that we ask quickly is, does any of this apply to you? No, I'm sorry, we skipped interpretation. Uh, very quickly, I'm just going to tell you, we won't have time to discuss because I only got a few minutes left. So the one word that I looked at that I thought was important, because again, now you're going to, what about this don't I understand? 
And I picked out one word, disciple. What does it mean to be a disciple? It's important. So the word there, math, A-T-O-O. Don't ask me to repeat that. I make disciples make into disciples. We're on the short definition and the definition. I make a disciple of. Train in discipleship, pass. I am trained, discipled, instructed. Are you with me? Okay. And then if we continue on there to disciple, helping someone to progressively learn the word of God, become a matured, growing disciple, literally a learner, a true Christ follower. And again, this is the Christian um, definition, if you would, to train, develop in the truths of scripture and the lifestyle required, helping a believer learn to be a disciple of Christ and belief in practice. So a disciple is simply what? A learner. What else? A what? A follower. Anything else stick out to you? Trained. Someone who's trained. Very good. Okay. Someone who has adopted a particular lifestyle of the one to whom is what? The one they're following. Very good. So they've learned the lifestyle also of the one they're following, and they're emulating that. Remember the, the, the rabbi? They didn't just take, they weren't just following him, but they were following his ways, his understanding of the Bible, and emulating those things, the way they live their life, the way that they believed in God. So for so, um, so as we're going... Jesus has instructed us, and I'm just going to tell you now because we're out of time, but I, I really like the process of us wrestling with it. I actually really enjoy that. But so Jesus is saying, go and help people do what? She's saying, go and make. But what were they to do? What was the primary thing? What was the end goal? That they would bring others to Jesus, but what would those others do? What is the disciple? See, the, the going, go into all the world make help them to know me and then help them to do what follow you're going to go and help people follow jesus that's it it's just that simple you're not going to christianize them you're not going to sundayize them you're just going to help them follow jesus that's the goal we get real confused and mixed up and we make it about a lot of other things but this is very clear here. A disciple is a student, a pupil, a learner, a follower of Jesus. And I always say, and you've heard me say this, I'm going to say a hundred times, but probably not that many. What he really means by follow my commands is follow me. Teach them to follow me in my way. We get all mixed up on commands. And we missed the primary thing here to, 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 to apply is that Jesus is saying, teach them how to follow me. So let's get back um, to the original question. Or no, for the next question in two minutes or less. What about this is applicable to you? What about this? So let's just look here. Um, he, he instructed them to go to the mountain where he told them to go. When he saw them, they worshiped him. So the, the question would be, have you met Jesus? And I'm just superimposing that on there. It's not direct, but 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 do you worship him? It's probably the better question. Yes. Do you worship him? Yes. All right. Do you sometimes doubt? Yes. It happens. I remember as a young Christian, I was like, oh, it was like a whirlwind. All right. Sometimes we doubt. Um, so does your Jesus have authority? And with his authority, has he instructed you to go? 
go where? Everywhere. Everywhere to everyone. It's just that simple. As the Holy Spirit will direct you. As the, it doesn't mean like everyone in your block, you got to go knock on every one of their doors. However, he may instruct you to do that. So go, that's the first thing. We, we, we mix these and we put them together. Go, are you instructed? You're instructed to go, yes? Go, and what are you supposed to do as you go? Teach, talk to people. Preach, declare, publish. Make known what? Jesus. So and we're going to talk about what is the gospel, what is, et cetera, what is the message. We're going to talk about that. Okay, so go and make, help people, right? And when they choose to follow him, what are you going to do with them? You're going to baptize them. And who gets to baptize them? So if you bring someone and you, let's do it, we'll do it together. Yeah? If you read someone, you're just going to get right up there with us. If you want. They're your, your disciple. Anyway, let's go on. So you're going to baptize them? Uh, and then what are you going to do with them after you've baptized them? Often we just put this all into one and it's not. What are you going to do with them now continuing? What does it say? 20, you're going to teach them. And you're going to teach them to do what? <sighs> I have failed miserably. I have failed miserably. <laughs> what are you going to teach them to do? To follow Jesus. Say that. Follow Jesus. That's what you're going to teach them to do. We can't get wrapped up in rules and regulations and obeying commands. You're going to teach them. But you have to know the one you follow before you know how to follow him. So you're going to teach them to follow him and his ways. It's the same thing. We're saying the same thing. We're saying the same thing. Don't misunderstand me. But you have to help them to know him to follow him and then his ways. Amen? Really, it's that simple. That's not... Yeah, okay. Uh, I think we're done. Amen, sister. Teach these new disciples to follow me and know that I am with you. Is Jesus with you? Yes. So each one of us are, are instructed to go. This is transferable truth. Something that happened then is transferable to you now. We're each instructed to go and help other people follow Jesus. And that's what we're going to accomplish here in this place. We're going to help you know better how to do that. Amen? That's the goal. That's the goal. Okay, so in your devotions, you have the same thing. You have five a week. gives you two off. Don't try to do them all in a day. Jesus wants to spend time with you every day, and we want you to use this as a part of that, spending time with him each day. Each day. Um, so you're going to just go over what we just talked about. Now it's your time to go home and wrestle with the Holy Spirit what we just talked about, you and him, not just because I told you, you and him in the Bible. Now it's your turn. And then we're going to come back next week and we'll talk a little about it. Father, we thank you for the revelation of your word by the Holy Spirit. Did you want us to know you, to respond to you, to do life with you? And your Holy Spirit is with us. And, and in that, there is such power in each one of us. Would you help us to spend time with you each day? And would you help us to go as we go in our everyday life to begin to help other people get to know you and then to know how to follow you? And so I ask that you'll help these, my brothers and sisters, to go into the deeper places with you. And having been in those deeper places with you, that you will overflow from them to others, that they will reflect your glory, having been with you. Other people will be drawn to you through them. So let the power of your Holy Spirit be better used by them. Help them. Help them with your authority to help other people. I ask that you'll bless these, my friends, my brothers and sisters, in Jesus' name. And everyone said...
Amen. Amen. I love you. If you have any questions, please see me. If you didn't check in at the beginning, you can see Michelle on the way out. Um, if you need material, if you didn't pay, et cetera, uh, you can check in with her on the way out. Did you have something? Okay. Okay. So just to, to follow up a couple things. Uh, so there's six more weeks of the journey. And then this will be finished, right? This um, then there'll be the summer break. We'll, we'll have.